間になる。I'd like to introduce Mr. Take Hiroshima, the Minister for Communication and Cultural Affairs. よろしくお願いします。Welcome to the Japan Information Cultural Center, the JICC, and thank you very much for coming out to our exhibition opening event tonight, which is additionally part of our International Education Week initiative. My name is Takeru Shimada. I am the Minister for Communication and Cultural Affairs of Japanese Embassy and Director of the JICC. The JICC is committed to enriching the relationship between Japan and the United States. And for the past 35 years, the JICC has been providing cultural events and educational programming to promote the understanding of Japan and Japanese culture. Tonight, we are opening our exhibition, Art from the Garden, Ceramics and Sculptures, by Mike, Mark Peter King. And we are fortunate to have Mr. Mark Peter King himself here with us to give a special lecture to discuss his beautiful artwork. Mark is a renowned landscape architect, writer, and artist. Having lived and worked in Kyoto, Japan for nearly 20 years, his work is heavily influenced by Japanese culture and aesthetics. Over the years, he has designed numerous private gardens for individuals, companies, and temples, and several of his projects have garnered much praise and awards including the grand prize at the 2000 Kyoto Art Festival. He is the author of eight books, including Japanese garden design and the art of setting stones. Mark's art is inspired by nature and based on the long history of Japanese arts and crafts. Several pieces of his art that you will see on display tonight are called Bonte. Many of you have probably heard of Japanese bonsai. Bonte sounds similar, but it is different. It, it translates to me, play gardens. In the words of the artist himself, these play gardens are meant to be reflection on the natural world. Using found materials, he creates assemblages that distill the nature, natural, natural world in abstract structures particularly by means of using essential aspects from the culture of Japanese gardens and reapplying these aspects as the basis of the, of the sculptural process. Overall, Mark's work, whether it be salt, gardens, writings, ceramics, or sculptures, is created with the purpose of reflecting the relationship between human culture and the natural world. Now, Please join me welcoming landscape structure Mark Peter King. is how uh, I move from doing garden design into doing ceramics and the bonte, the tray gardens, how those are linked, the way I see them as being linked, and the connections, the underlying connections of Japanese culture that you see in all of those art forms. So we're going to start with a short video about one of my gardens.
garden is called the Tiger Glen Garden. It's in Ithaca, New York at the Johnson Museum. You might have noticed at the end the video was made uh, by my son Kai Ki, who's sitting in the front row because he lives here in DC. So it's <laughs> nice for me to be down here to have some family time as well as uh, lecture time. So the gardens that I'm building are obviously like this one, made out of very uh, simple natural materials, uh, moss and stone, things are heavily patina. There is that wonderful wabi or sabi quality, the aspect of this beautiful patina that comes with age and time. And you'll see later on how that gets worked into my other artwork as well. That should be happening. <laughs> Please turn your phones off. <laughs> Don't embarrass yourself. <laughs> so now a little bit of a look at how um, I turned to ceramics. Um, this ceramic was made by my wife, Momoko Takeshi She's also sitting in the front row. And no, I'm not going to turn this into a family lecture where you see my slides of trips to Paris and things like that. But it just happens that uh, family is a uh, connection in this art that I'm doing. So Momoko's work is um, raw clay, no glazes, that goes into an anagama, a wood-fired kiln, stays in the kiln for four or five days. And the effects of the uh, surface that you see all come from the natural effects of flame and ash in the anagama. And my work also is the same. And we share a studio. I'm upstairs, she's down. So the reason I kind of moved from doing garden design into doing ceramics is because every day I had uh, clay right there and was able to begin fiddling with it, putting a little bit on uh, leaves and sticks, firing that in our communal firings, and really beginning to understand the process of creating ceramics. Now, whereas Momoko's works are very uh, simple in their form, you'll see that the work I do of uh, bringing the garden leaves, twigs, uh, sticks into the ceramics makes them much more uh, rough and organic. So first, a little bit, for those of you, I'm sure some people in the audience know a lot about ceramics, and you may be ceramic artists or scholars of ceramics. But for those who don't know, ceramics is the process of taking clay and firing it at a very high temperature and changing it in its chemical and physical structure so that it becomes hard. It changes from clay into ceramic. The kiln that we use, my wife and I, is called an anagama, which really means cave kiln. It's a single chamber kiln. You can see here, um, there's one large cave-like chamber and a chimney in the back, that's the front. And the way it works is uh, fire is burned inside the kiln right in the front. And then work of art is, stored, is stacked here on shelves. And the flame goes up and out the chimney. So it's a very, very simple kiln. And the fire, actually, when you'll see later in, in the video clips, the fire, at, when this gets up to temperature, is actually going all the way through the kiln, out the chimney, and up the top. So all of the work that's in the kiln is being licked by the flames for four days. Now the kiln that we use, or the ones that we participate in, is a communal kiln where a number of artists gather together and fire their work as a group. Um, that's the door that you enter to load your work in. And you begin by stacking work in the very back, and you move forward in, in a series of three different shelves. There are portals that let you look in during the firing. You'll see later on that you can, uh, first of all, check the cones. That's how you check the temperature. But also, you'll see a video clip where a woman is loading wood in to the back in order to raise the temperature in the back so the back isn't cooler than the front. You actually stoke wood from the side as well. This is the middle shelf stack. Um, a kiln like this will take about six or seven hundred pieces. Most of the pieces are small cups, so you get a lot of them in. Uh, very few of them are larger works, but we do add in some of our sculptural works as well. 
when the whole kiln is fully stacked, um, the front door is bricked up, so it turns into a brick wall. This is Fred Herbst, he's the kiln master, the person who built the kiln and runs all the kiln firings. And then in the very beginning, um, a little fire is made here in the front, and eventually you'll start loading to that door. One thing I wanted to show you here, we, we switch between hardwood and softwood. So the hardwood has a lot of BTUs, that'll be something like an oak. The softwood is a pine, it has a lot of resin, and it makes for a good ash. Um, you need several cords of wood to do one firing, so there's a lot of splitting that goes on. When it gets up to temperature, as you load wood in the front, as the wood is moving into the kiln, it's already burning. It's about 2,000 degrees inside the kiln. So the process of loading, uh, you really feel the heat once it's up to temperature. Now this is the door in the back. And you can see the flame moving here. You see how it moves almost slowly? Uh, it gets not quite to a plasma state, but the heat inside the kiln is so great that the flame moves kind of in slow motion through the air. As I mentioned, to keep the back of the kiln hot, we put small sticks of wood in the very back. Large pieces of wood in the front, small in the back, and we try and bring the whole kiln up to an even temperature. Then when the firing is finished, that door in the front and all the other portholes are bricked up and sealed with clay so that the temperature inside will not drop quickly. And a week later, we take all the work out and lay it out as it comes out so that we have kind of a photograph of how the kiln uh, changed the pieces, usually darker in the back, more ash and gray in the front, that sort of thing. So that's the process of firing which is the same for Momoko's very simple work and also the same for my organic work. And this idea of taking ceramics from the garden, part of it is, of course, the fact that I'm using leaves and, and gravel and things that you would imagine are garden materials. But also part of it is the concept of what the garden is, that the garden is a place where the natural world and the cultural world of humans meet in a very elegant way. So. Not only does my work contain materials of nature in the garden, the leaves and the gravel, but it also expresses this meeting point of wild nature and human-controlled nature. Um, this piece is on display here. It's a nest-like form that's made out of grasses, uh, meadow grasses, and inside are leaves. These are small leaves um, from my own garden up in Ithaca. And they're all dipped in clay. They're dipped in a slip, like a liquid clay. And they're very thin. You know, when, once they burn, the leaf is gone. They shrink. And paper thin doesn't even describe it. They're very, very thin. But if you look at them closely, you can see every vein, almost the cellular structure of the leaf, is still captured there. So I kind of see these as being um, shadows, three-dimensional shadows of what used to be. The plant itself is gone, but there's some kind of remnant shadow that exists in these works. <clears throat> there's one piece here which is black, and that one leaf I treated with iron, an iron-based clay. So when I fired it, the others turn that's kind of a golden color, and that one turns black. that remains um, even after firing. This piece 
is made only out of leaves, maple leaves. So the entire piece um, is basically the thickness of a maple leaf, but in clay. So it's extremely fragile. In order to ship this out to the west coast, I needed to create a special box where it would be held like this on the inside, because I can't touch the outside. If you touch the outside to pack it, you'll crack it. So it had to be held just from the inside with a pad in a box that was put in a separate box to ship out. So um, I just point that out because a lot of the work I'm doing is experimental, and this is not necessarily a good commercial product. You know, It's not the kind of thing that you can easily put on shelves in stores. That's not my purpose. To the degree that it's difficult and fragile, breakable, it's also quite beautiful. And um, there's no way to get around that. You can't make something that has that beauty of fragility without it being fragile. Um, this piece, which is also on display called Twist, was made with very long blades of grass, kind of a grass called miscanthus. It's kind of a meadow grass. It has you know, yard-long blades. And I dip those in a clay slip, so a liquid clay. And then the process I'm doing of spinning them and moving them is akin to drawing. If you can imagine taking a piece of charcoal and drawing kind of spinning circles on a piece of paper, and then imagine trying to do that in three dimensions in space. Of course, you can't draw a charcoal in space. It doesn't have anything to stick to. So what the grasses do is they let me draw with clay in three dimensions. They let me do this, and then they remain there. And when they're burned, the grasses go out. And what we're left with is a three-dimensional <coughs> drawing in clay. Uh, this piece called Tube Cube is also on display. Uh, the plant used here is called knotweed, Japanese knotweed. It's um, it's a plant that came over from Japan in some shipment by accident. It grows like crazy along the rivers here. It's incredibly invasive, and you can find it everywhere. So I go out into the area around my house and find patches of this, and cut it and dry it, and then use it. It's a tubular plant, like bamboo, but not as hard. It's much softer than that. And I build <coughs> large blocks out of alternating layers of these tubes. And then I carve the block to make sculptures like this. Um, and the pieces that I carve off that are remnant, you'll see later, I also use those pieces to build other sculptures. What I like about these pieces, there's a quality about it. You look at it, you think it might be a bee's nest or a termite's nest or something like that. There's something that is so primitive, it's not even human primitive. It's like before human, that kind of period. And yet, when you look at it, it also looks very beautiful as a as a, a abstract sculpture, just the cube and the whole and the way they relate. So there's an aspect that's very clearly design and human control, and there's an aspect that feels like it's completely uh, pre-human, somehow naturally made. This piece called Wheel, also on display, was made in the same way, building a large block out of knotweed and clay, and then carving the circular wheel form out of it. All of these pieces, they all go into the anagama with no glaze, there's nothing put on them, they're just bare clay when they go in. And the effects of the fire, the ash and the heat, is what makes all of the surface and coloring that you see. Um, this crescent piece, this one was made out of, um, again, a kind of miscanthus, not the blade part, but the stem, you know, like the, like, kind of like um, straw. And it was a bowl that I had made and fired. And then I took the fired bowl and I sliced it into what turned out to be crescent shapes and then mounted them so that it would be a uh, sculpture sitting uh, almost like floating above a pedestal. The pedestal, in this case, is made out of 
wood, a uh, piece of old wood that I found, which I burned, I charred. And that charred black is, also, is a beautiful black, but it also has that quality of having been burned, just like the ceramic was burned in the fire. So it's the perfect base for that work. Um, this piece is made out of, as I had described, when I carve a larger work, I, I'm left over with pieces that fall off the main block. And then I take those pieces and sometimes subdivide them, and you can glue them together with clay, uh, and then take that glue together piece and put it in the anagama and fire it. Uh, this one has some very interesting qualities where the inner part is almost bone colored. It's a white bone color, whereas the outside um, has gotten darker in the fire. These tower pieces, there's several of them out there. When I look at them, I see architecture, that, of course small, like a model of architecture, but I imagine some future kind of architecture where buildings are built by machines like insects, you know, flying machines that can apply some kind of resin and uh, build architecture the way bees build nests. They might make these sorts of forms. And this uh, piece, which is the last piece I'll talk about with ceramics, is um, it's one of the most recent ones I've made. It's not made with plants. This is made by mixing gravel. Um, you know if you've seen gardens, what Americans call Zen gardens with raked white sand. It's that white sand that I use mixed with a white porcelainous clay to do these pieces. And the, the gravel melts. It, it melts and it almost looks like a melted piece of metal when you look closely at <coughs> these. But this piece, um, there's an inner bowl shape and then there were fins that were applied to the outside. And when I fired it, the fins opened. And they opened more than I had expected. <clears throat> and when I looked at that finished product, it struck me um, in this way. Uh, if you know Japanese history, there are a couple books called the Nihon Shoki and the Kojiki that record the old history of Japan. And they have chapters in them in the beginning called the Age of the Gods, where they describe the way the world came into being the way Japan came into being. And you could imagine that if the story of how ceramics came into being had been written in one of these books, it isn't, this is my own story, but if they had written in the, these books the story of how ceramics came into the world, the story would be something like this, that there was a flower made of soil, made of earth, and that flower was put into a fire and it bloomed. And from the inside of the bloom came the first bowl. You know, that there would be some sort of mythological story of how the first ceramic bowl came into being. When I saw this piece having opened and flowered in the kiln, that's what came to my mind. It looked like the original, the original ceramic bowl somehow, um, having flowered and come into being inside the Okay, so now I'm going to move away from ceramics and into the talk about the tray gardens. As you came in today, in the very front of the hall, there were three of my tray gardens there. In East Asia, there are many uh, tray arts. For instance, there's bonsai. Bon means tray, sai means plant. So bonsai is the <coughs> idea of putting a miniature, carefully pruned plant on a tray. There's bon seki, seki means stone, or sometimes it's called sui seki, where you put a stone on a tray. There are many of these different arts in China, Korea, Japan, Vietnam, where people distill nature into some basic, very basic component and place it on a tray for viewing indoors. So what I'm doing in these bon te is not trying to miniaturize a garden and put it on a tray. I'm not trying to make a little garden. What I'm trying to do is take some fundamental aspect of Japanese gardens and or nature and flesh that out, <coughs> spin out that aspect, and then create tray-like sculptures that express it. 
So one of those things that I'm doing, um, which you will see in two of the works out there, is the aspect of Japanese gardens and many of Japanese arts to make a balance between things that are very clearly human controlled and things that are very clearly drawn from nature. Things that are human controlled in the language of the tea ceremony are called shin, the aesthetic of shin. And things that are looser, wilder, freer, uh, more serendipitous, or somehow just drawn from nature are called so, shin and so. So in the tea ceremony, just to give you some kind of idea to grasp, the original bowls for tea ceremony that were brought over from China, which were porcelains, uh, often covered with a um, very beautiful glaze, were quite perfect. They were perfectly circular. Their finish was perfectly done. And that aesthetic of objects that were an expression of human perfection, of the utmost skill of the human hand at making something, are what people in the tea ceremony called shin. Could be a porcelain vase or cup. The painting is perfect. The strokes of the brush are perfect. Everything is done without mistake. The firing is perfect. None of this ash on top, you know. Everything is put in a sagger box, a kind of a clay box, which protects it so you don't get any uh, ash falling on it. It all comes out bright white and beautiful. In opposition to that, in the Japanese tea ceremony, people started using locally made or sometimes Korean or Vietnamese made tea bowls which were wobbly, irregular, um, imperfect, sometimes cracked, uh, the glazing dripping in odd ways, not, not at all uh, perfected, and uh, very much affected by the fire that they were fired in. And you can see in these bowls that's so aesthetic. So in the garden, if you look for Shin and So, there are many ways that you can see it. In this photograph, the garden itself is made of natural materials. It's seen through the frame of the architecture. And the crisp frame of the architecture really brings the garden um, into a level that it wouldn't be if you were seeing it through a less clear frame. Imagine instead of seeing this garden through the openings in architecture like this, imagine if you were seeing it through a planting of trees, just loose, loose trees or brush or kind of a weedy lot or something like that. The garden in the distance would not be this brilliant, precise artwork that captures your eye. It would get lost in the frame that was holding it. It is this layering of the Shin architecture, the crisp and clear architecture, and that naturalistic garden in the back that makes the two read more strongly. Here's another example at Honenin in northern Kyoto, where the garden looks very much just like an extension of the mountain. And the building looks kind of like a forest, but a forest that's been processed by people. And you've got these two things together. Even simple things like earthen walls. The garden design in Japan will be irregular, um, unplanned, seemingly unplanned, uh, loose plantings like this. And then in the back of that will be a very crisp backdrop. Not a complex backdrop, but a very smooth, clean, human-made backdrop. And that backdrop is what brings the foreground of the garden into focus. It's this combination of Shin and So that make the two read so clearly. Or in this case, it's a distant view of a mountain. That hedge that you see in the middle, you know, if you imagine if you took that hedge out, and if the bamboo that's in the distance just sort of came forward and sort of invaded the garden, the whole thing would be quite soft. It would all be soft. 
the foreground would be solved, the middle ground would be solved, the background would be solved. But by introducing this one crisp human element, it really pulls it together as a work of art, much more of a painting than just a view. Or something as simple as um, in this garden, where the garden itself is quite wild, uh, shrubs and trees that are unpruned, seemingly, and in the middle is this gorgeous woven fence. And it's that introduction of the human element into the wild that makes it into a garden. Or in something as simple as a detail element, this is a part of a veranda. It's a veranda near a water basin where when you use the water to wash your hands, if the water drips, it can fall through the bamboo. Imagine that made out of straight pieces of wood. Possible, it would be fine, it would be like a deck. But by making it out of bamboo, you take these elements that are clearly wild things, the bamboo in its natural state, but you compound them into one clean rectangular frame. And now you have, again, that composition of irregular things pulled together into a clean and geometric form. This fence is made out of the utmost cheap material, bamboo twigs. You know, you go into a bamboo forest, you have mountains of these things. They just fall off the bamboos, and it's really the cheapest of the cheap stuff. And if you have one of these bamboo twigs, it really is meaningless. But if you take 10,000 of them, and you bundle them, and layer them together into this long fence, suddenly the most simple random element, the natural element of a bamboo twig, turns into a beautiful sculptural fence. So again, it's this combination <coughs> of an element, a singular element, which is so nat natural, composed into a larger object that is sheen. It's a controlled and designed object. Same thing here, those upside down bundles you see in the fence, those are also bamboo twigs. Each one um, very irregular and nothing to look at, but if you put them together in this very carefully processed bundling way, then the whole thing becomes something new. So the way I'm doing this in the tray gardens, I'm fleshing out this aspect of shin processed, and so the natural. And in this card, in this uh, tray, it's separated by a ceramic wall. Uh, these ceramics, again, were fired in the same anagama that the other works were done in. And one side is made of pebbles evoking the feeling of a riverbank. And the other side is made actually out of a piece of corrugated roof material that I found in a farmer's field that was been there for 30 years, completely covered with rust. But it looks like the wave motion on a river. And this looks very much like the pebbles on the bank of a river, thus the title by the riverside. But one side of this tray somehow more closely expresses its beauty through the man-processed way. And the other side through uh, the sort of natural element. This again is the same um, concept. In this case, what I've done is use slate, stone on one side, and a piece of bark from a, a hemlock tree on the other. The title, the plowman's dream, the plowman in this case, you know, when you plow, uh, you're furrowing things, you're making lines and things when you plow. And it is the nature of nature to furrow things, like the bark of a tree as it grows and splits you end up with these natural furrowed lines in thick bark. And in our agriculture, or in our human development, we also tend to <laughs> furrow things, to make a pattern in our landscape that clearly reads as human pattern. So in this particular ponte, we have the furrowing of nature as opposed to the furrowing of the human hand. And 
in this um, last example of a ponte, the interesting thing about this is that both sides are made out of pine. One side is an old pine board that I found on an old barn that had fallen down. And the other side is fresh pine bark from a, well, fresh from, taken from a forest off a tree that also had fallen down. So everything in this sculpture, left and right, is pine. But one side is pine as it is when it grows on a tree. And the other side is pine after quite a series of processes of being cut by human hands, then built into a building by human hands, then weathered, then taken off and reprocessed. So at this time, uh, we will come questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and we will bring you a microphone. Can you bring the house lights up a bit further so I can see the audience? Oh, when you design a garden, uh, according to the Sakuteki, if you have to put something in the garden, it, do you go for the joy, joy mansi, you know, the jin jan, yes. or your intuition? So the question was, it relates to the Sakuteki, a book written about a thousand years ago on how to build a garden, a book that I translated with uh, Professor Takei, and you can see that book out in the lobby if you're interested. And in the book, it discusses quite a bit about geomancy. Geo is geology, earthmancy is magic, earth magic. So it's kind of an ancient physics that the Chinese developed and the Japanese later used to try and understand how they should design their world. The question was, do I use geomancy or my own feelings? In my case, my own feelings. Um, geomancy is very much, um, certainly though geomancy in the Sakuteki is a thousand years old. And although there are some aspects of traditional culture which I still include in the way I think. I'm also very interested in 21st century understanding of nature and how things are put together and why the world is the way it is. So I'm more likely to use tectonic plate theory than uh, geomancy in the design of my garden. So thank you. Other question? So I was a little bit surprised when you said that there is a lot of the relationship between the, the Shinso, it's, it's, uh, it's very close to the Japanese approach. In the gardens, the separation is pretty clear. It's like a wall that separates the Shin from the soul. And how do you think about it, and how, why did you decide to do so in your, in your trade gardens? Yes, I think I understand your question. In the Bonte I've made, the separation between Shin and So is clear. Left side is one thing, right side is the other. Although, if you look at them carefully, you'll see that, for instance, with that corrugated metal, which is on the Shin side, because it's a human process, machine press element, it's also very heavily patinaed with rust, which is a So quality. And the pebbles on the other side, although they're natural materials in the So, they're very carefully placed and arranged, so there is a certain shame quality. So it, things are not completely left and right, but it is a purposeful sculptural technique to show the difference of sheen and so. Um, you won't find that kind of clear separation in a garden. Uh, yes, yes, I know. I just um, wanted to understand better your approach, your personal approach, like. Philosophical approach, so do you see that there is a world between the two worlds, or from the human approach toward, toward, toward what, whatever the nature can bring us, or it's just a single? Um, I don't see a, a wall between humans and nature in, in the general sense. I, I think I understand what you're saying. In these sculptures, I use wood fired ceramics 
to accentuate the difference between the left and the right side. But, but I do not, I'm not intending to express that uh, the natural world and the human world are somehow separated by the wall. Yes, sir. Could you talk a little bit more about Wabi Sabi in the garden? Sure. Um, Wabi and Sabi are words that derive from the tea ceremony originally. They're aesthetics of um, an interest in things that have a sense of poverty, timelessness, or uh, the, eight, the patina of time. Both of those words uh, can be somewhat used interchangeably, but they both express this subtle, understated aesthetic that enjoys the serendipitous, the natural, the impoverished, the irregular, that sort of thing. So um, in garden design, you would say that if you were interested in things that were highly symmetrical, very showy, bright colors, um, left and right being designed in such a way that it had a sense of human power, that would not be evoking the spirit of an enjoyment of poverty or simplicity. So the fact that Japanese gardens are asymmetrical, that they often feature a color palette of greens and browns rather than uh, complex color schemes. The fact that they use materials that weather over time and it, it's enjoyed that they do weather over time. All of those aspects could be considered a wabi aesthetic seen in the garden. That answer. Other questions? Do you have other questions? You can see those works. The question was, um, I'm not sure that was loud enough to hear, the wall shape in the Bonte, was that cement or what was the material? All of those are wood-fired ceramics. You can see them out as you leave in the front. If you look closer, you'll see that they are um, a wood-fired ceramic. And I use that because I like to do wood-fired ceramics, and so that was a nice way to make that form. Did. So the question was um, a personal one, how I ended up living in Ithaca, New York, which is where I live. Um, I lived in Japan for nearly 20 years and was offered uh, to teach for a year at Cornell University, which is in Ithaca. And my wife and son and I moved over to Ithaca so I could teach for a year. The fellowship would end, would go back to Kyoto, but we never went back to Kyoto. So that's why I'm still there. The kiln was built at Corning Community College by Fred Herbst, who was in the photograph, like bricking up the, the door. And um, it's fired communally, so a number of artists in the area get together and, and use it together. Uh, so we weren't involved in the building of it, just the using of it. Um, what is the source of your clay? Is it prepared clay that you prepare or buy, or is it done? Um, many of the pieces were made with a clay called B-mix, which is a porcelainous, a white porcelain-based uh, clay that's specifically designed for wood fires. There's a B-mix wood. But um, often my works are made out of white clays that I get from my friends. So my friends, lots of friends are potters. They have what are called slops. So the carvings off their pieces go into a bucket. They're not going to reuse them. So I go get the white slops from my friends and use them interchangeably, mixed. So a lot of the pieces, I can't determine what the clay is. It's a white porcelain-based clay of some kind. You know, um, I, I actually don't know in many cases. You have another question? This thing. Good idea. You use the, the word serendipitous. It sounds like, uh, although you're thinking a lot about what the effect might be of something that you're exploring. Did you share any times when you were just totally surprised by the direction you were going that turned out differently or something that didn't behave the way you expected it to be that sent you in a whole new direction? 
Right, so the question is about serendipity and when have I been surprised in making things? That, one, one example that I just did describe was that earth flower. I expected it, that the ribs would hold tighter to the piece. They tended to bloom or open in the kiln, and that was something that was a, quite a surprise for me and a surprise. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much.